The Housing Assistance Council, or HAC, is a national nonprofit that supports affordable housing efforts throughout rural America. Since 1971, HAC has provided below market financing for affordable housing and community development, technical assistance and training, research and information, and policy formulation to enable solutions for rural communities. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Preparing Your Organization for Disaster, a Guide to Rural Resilience. As disasters become more frequent, organizations will need to make themselves ready to address the associated housing challenges in their communities. Join HACK during National Preparedness Month to hear from local organizations that have experienced natural disasters from fires to flooding. Discover the value of being prepared and learn how to make your organization disaster resilient. We will also showcase our Rural Resilience in the Face of Disaster website and offer tools to help prepare your organization for disaster. Thank you to HUD's Rural Capacity Building Program for sponsoring today's event. And now to introduce our speakers. Scott McReynolds, the Executive Director of the Housing Development Alliance, or HDA, has worked in the rehabilitation and construction of affordable housing in Eastern Kentucky since 1992. Under his leadership, the Housing Development Alliance has grown from a staff of one to over 35. Since 1996, the Housing Development Alliance has completed over 340 new homes, completed over 900 repairs for low-income homeowners, and developed 43 rental units. In recent years, HDA created Redbud Financial Alternates, a CDFI to combat predatory consumer lending, and Hope Building, a paid on-the-job training program for people in recovery that produces workforce housing. HDA is on a mission to provide housing solutions to 1,000 families in just 10 years. Scott is on the board of the FAHI, the National Rural Housing Coalition, Invest Appalachia, the Appalachian Impact Fund, and the Community Foundation of Perry County. When he is not working, he can be found hiking, running, wood carving, coaching youth soccer, or baking pastries. Scott has a Master's of Divinity from the Candler School of Theology of Emory University. Teresa Nantor, Director of Rental Housing Development, joined Community Housing Improvement Program, or CHIP, in 2021. She came to CHIP with more than 20 years of experience in affordable housing, lending, and grants management. Before joining the CHIP leadership team, she served in affordable housing management positions for local and tribal government organizations. She focused on land development and financing for single and multifamily affordable housing projects. She managed a HUD-approved housing counseling program for almost a decade at a seven-county regional planning organization, which primarily focused on preparing people for home ownership, housing rehabilitation, financial literacy, and foreclosure prevention. She is interested in affordable housing development, disaster recovery, and preparedness for under-resourced communities. Teresa received a Master's of Public Administration and a Bachelor's Degree in Sociology from The Ohio State University. Allison Duncan is an experienced housing professional with experience in real estate development, data analysis, program management, team building, and budgeting. Before joining HACC, Ms. Duncan worked as the Assistant Director of Development and Capital Projects for the Annapolis, Maryland Housing Authority, where she worked on several housing development and preservation projects. She gained underwriting and financial analysis skills as an associate at New Market Venture Partners, where she structured and evaluated venture deals. She also served as workforce analyst for the City of Baltimore's Mayor's Office of Employment Development and as a Quaker Youth Programs Manager. Ms. Duncan also provided small business consulting services for two years, including financial modeling, projections, and accounting support. She holds a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Maryland and a BA from Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina. Now I will hand it over to Allison to get us started. Welcome everyone and thank you for that intro, Dan. On behalf of Housing Assistance Council, I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar, Preparing Your Organization for Disaster, A Guide to Rural Resilience. Go ahead and share your location in the chat. We wanna see where everyone is coming from. I think I saw um, states across the nation represented. Um, 
we'll also use the chat um, for you to ask questions through the webinar. Um, just put one in there um, whenever it comes to your mind and we'll try to answer them all at the end. Um, also, before we get started, um, oh, Maryland, where else? Montana, Illinois, DC, Kansas City. I mean, I saw, um, yeah, there we are. I saw Claudia, so Hawaii is here, um, Colorado. That's great. We're also going to, um, Dan's going to share a poll. Um, go ahead and share it, and we'll um, want to see your answers. Argentina. Oh, yes, Nick. Czar. So uh, there should be a pop up on your screen. Rate your experience with disaster preparedness. Are you a novice, beginner? Do you feel competent or proficient? So far, um, majority here are beginners, which is great. We hope that you get some important um, lessons here today and feel a little more confident um, or at least prepared um, to know what your next steps are through the through the course of today. Um, so we only need to look at the news from just the past few days um, to see there's natural disasters in Alaska and Puerto Rico and see the impact climate change related natural disasters are having across America, especially in rural communities. As many of you well know, the communities we serve are already challenged by higher rates of poverty, lower incomes and limited access to safe, quality, affordable housing. As these disasters continue to grow in frequency and impact, Rural communities need resources and support to ensure their resiliency. At the Housing Assistance Council, our job is to empower communities to build safe, quality, affordable homes by providing below market financing, technical assistance, training, and information services. We also provide communities with the resources to prepare for, respond to, and recover from natural disasters. Our website provides location-specific information and resources that you can use when responding to disasters. Our new platform, Rural Resilience, offers tools to help prepare your organization for disaster. You'll learn more about that later in this webinar. We hope you'll join the conversation on social media using the hashtag Rural Resilience. Again, so glad you can join us, and I can't wait to hear from these amazing presenters. Now I'd like to hand it over to Scott McReynolds, um, who is here with us today. Thanks, Allison. Um, so what folks probably need to know uh, is that we are on day 56 of our disaster, which means we're exhausted. Um, I'm exhausted, so if uh, bear with me if I'm not completely coherent. Um, the, um, the other thing is that I have a somewhat, um, I think, incomplete view of what it's like um, to, to go through a disaster like this, uh, but hopefully being in the, you know, right in the thick of it um, gives me some insight into, you know, kind of what I wish we had prepared. Um, hopefully the slides are working. My screen's a little wonky, uh, but hopefully. Um, so the first one, sorry, um, is just a little bit of context of who we are and what we do. We, we normally, we build houses, repair houses, and, and do a little bit of rental. We work in um, Southeast Kentucky, down there in the corner. At, it's the heart of the Appalachian coal fields. We're in um, ARC distress communities. Um, and so when we left the office on the 27th of July, we had a housing crisis already. Um, about 40% of our population is inadequately housed, um, including homeless doubled up, living in severely substandard housing, overcrowded cost burden. We already had 100 plus families on our new home waiting list and 100 plus families on our uh, rehab waiting list. Um, and then, you know, on July, the evening of the July 27th and the day of July 28th, it started raining and it didn't stop. Um, it rained for about nine hours. We had somewhere between 10 and 12 inches of rain um, fall in that nine hours. Um, what that meant, I mean, that's not a good thing if you live in a, in a flat land, uh, but we live in the mountains and, and our particular topography tends to be very narrow uh, valleys. And so this is, um, I tried to capture an image. Um, 
this is actually one of the, the creeks that was really flooded and you can see these narrow valleys between these steep hillsides. So when you get 10 inches of rain, it runs downhill to the creek and then it runs down to the creek. Um, and so what that means, um, the little dots on there are houses. So you can see the valley is very narrow. And these creeks that are normally six inches and a couple of steps uh, wide became 25 and 30 foot deep raging torrents of water. Um, and it just really washed away everything in its path. And so just a few images of, of houses that got pushed off their foundations, houses that got washed off their foundations, houses who had their foundations washed out from under them. Um, the the creeks flow into the rivers and so then the rivers flooded um we did get the backup you can see the trailer picture there of just the very deep water around the rivers uh it washed out our roads our sewers our water lines bridges um just did a tremendous amount uh, of damage um and of course we all of this is about not just the housing but the people involved um, so, Dan, if you can stop the slide, that's all the slides I have. Um, so, a few facts about the, the, the our event. We had 40 uh, fatalities and two people are still missing. Um, one of our partners estimates or had 700 and, 1,750 families self-report that their house was a total loss. Um, Myself and a couple of the other housing advocates think that's going to be a low figure when this is said and done. Um, we had over uh, 10,500 families file for FEMA assistance because their housing was damaged. FEMA actually has verified 6,744 houses that had at least one inch of water inside the house. Um, so it and, and it actually works out to in the four hardest to hit counties, and we served three of them. Um, that one in six houses had water in it. Um, so the, it's the scope of the problem um, is, is pretty amazing. Um, despite that, uh, we were actually, the Housing Development Alliance was actually incredibly lucky. The only assets we lost directly was a, a one work van with tools and an HVAC unit on a rental system, a rental unit. Um, out of our 30 plus staff, only two had to, significant impacts um and, and and their houses and and um of, of the 340 houses we built we only lost one um although three or four uh did get water in them um so all in all that we were very lucky and and in some ways that was um made in a lot of ways that makes our response a lot easier um we you know had we been directly impacted had our offices been flooded like some other nonprofits, we would have been had a really uh, a much more difficult time responding. Um, so we woke up, you know, Thursday morning. Actually, most of us had been up all night because we knew something was going on and it was big uh, to this reality of this huge flood. Um, I was actually stranded at my house. Um, my driveway was washed out and wasn't passable. I didn't have electricity or Internet or um, uh, so I was relying on spotty cell service. Uh, had it, had I been able to get off the mountain, uh, I live in a little community called Krypton, Kentucky, and there was no way in and out. There's only three roads in and out, and two of those were destroyed, and one, one's not even been repaired yet, and one was flooded. Um, and so I think that's my first lesson to learn. As you begin to plan for a disaster and as you complete the, the document that HACK is um, going to share with you, you need to be uh, prepared for the reality that some key staff members may be isolated and may not be fully capable of, of performing what they normally would. Um, and, it, and it's entirely possible some of them may be incapacitated. Um, so as you think about your disaster preparedness, it's important to think about, well, what would we do if this person uh, wasn't available um, or this person wasn't? The second thing that really ties into is, is being prepared for communication in difficult times. Um, we found during those initial phases that text was the most reliable. Um, but of course, uh, you know, we had key, I had key staff members, but I didn't have all 30 staff members uh, text number in my phone. And so uh, checking up on people even was difficult. So to, to have that kind of disaster preparedness communication plan is, is I think critical. So while I was shoveling the mud trying to get my driveway uh, passable, 
um, my management team really stepped up and, and actually uh, had us doing relief work day one. We had several of our trucks out delivering supplies and water to where they needed to go. Uh, day two, my management team was already negotiating the county with some county to do some FEMA contracting um, for some uh, critical services that we had the capacity to provide to the county. Um, and that really is, I think, my third takeaway is if you're going to be prepared for a disaster, you got to have an empowered staff and you have to have a competent staff. Um, you know, everything can't run through the director because the director might not be available. Um, so, again, one thing that shoveling mud will give you a lot of time to do is think. Um, so it didn't take me long as I thought about what was going on um, to realize that we weren't going to be able to do what we normally do for several days. Um, I mean, there was no power. The bridges were out. The roads were out. There was no water at sites. Uh, we were supposed to pour a footer the next day and, you know, I, the concrete plant's not operating. Um, so we were clearly going to have some business um, continuity issues and challenges. Um, and, and so we st I started thinking about that, um, but actually by the end of the second or third day, it was clear that this disaster was so big that we were going to have to respond in a way that we've never responded to disasters before. We've had some minor flooding, some minor windstorm damage, ice storm damage, that sort of thing um, in the years that I've worked there. And we've always taken the, the um, kind of position that we're not really good at, recover at re relief efforts. Um, and that we were going to be there for recovery. Um, it was really clear that this event was so big um, that we had to be involved directly in the relief efforts uh, and not just wait around for the recovery. Um, you know, the community needed us to use our skills and our experience and our staff and our equipment and our trucks and everything to, to, to get involved in the relief work. And two things I realized shortly thereafter. One was I didn't have any money to pay for that. Um, you know, I had lots of money to build houses and repair houses. I didn't have money to muck out houses. I didn't have money um, to drive a truck around and deliver water. Um, the other reality is about 70% of our operating funding comes from the construction activities that we weren't going to be doing because we were busy doing relief efforts. Um, and so this is another example of uh, business continuity challenges. But this one's a little different because we were voluntarily for go. I mean, we after about a week, we probably could have gone back to building and repairing houses, um, but we we were choosing not to. And so, again, as you make your plan, think not only about how a disaster might prevent you from doing uh, what you want to do, but also think about how you may choose not to do what you normally do in order to respond to that disaster. Because um, for us, that was a much larger business disruption than than what the disaster itself caused. Um, so we we got on the phone to some of our donors and funders, and we were really fortunate to get an early win. We got a grant of seventy five thousand uh, dollars, actually a donation of seventy five thousand dollars that allowed us to really jump in. And then the fact that we were doing that work and we were fully committed to it. Um, led to a lot of other donors and, and funders coming through. And so we were actually able to raise about three to four months of operating money to allow us to really focus on flood relief. Um, and so, you know, I think disasters are one big stress test. Um, and that means that, um, you know, it shows you what you're good at and what you're not good at. And so we, um, you know, obviously we had good relationships with funders. That was something that we figured out. We had a strong staff. Um, we had some weaknesses around technology. Um, I had to have my computer like dealt with, uh, re-upgraded uh, during this like day four of the disaster. And I was just absolutely terrified that I was gonna be completely shut off while that was happening. Um, so, you know, as you do go through your plan, um, Think about what you're good at, what you're not good at, what your strengths and your weaknesses, and be honest. And uh, one of the best things you can do about um, getting um, you know, ready for a disaster is to work on those weaknesses, uh, because a disaster will definitely point those out. Um, we had had, to, I mentioned some of those minor disasters we had been through, and that was kind of proved to be a real benefit, that we kind of knew how disasters work. 
um, what FEMA, you know, how FEMA worked, how uh, the different stages, the the relief or the uh, and the recovery, and um, what a VOAD was, and and just all of these different things um, that that we're now inundated with. And so, if you've not been through a disaster, then I would want to make part of your disaster preparedness kind of finding a place where you could do a disaster 101. And just kind of learn about what the um, what all of those pieces that uh, FEMA, VOADs, long-term recovery groups, all of those sorts of things, how they fit together, just so that you're not having to learn that in the midst of a disaster. Um, I think my last takeaway is it's great to have a plan, but that's not sufficient. Uh, my little confession is uh, to placate a funder. We actually did a disaster recovery plan this summer, uh, but I had one of my staff members did it um, and he didn't really share it and we didn't train our staff in it and we didn't use it because nobody knew it was there. Um, so you do the plan, um, do it with a group of staff members, train your staff in what the plan says and where it is um, so that if you do have a disaster, um, folks really know. And, and had we been directly hit, I think we would have really paid the price uh, for not having shared and trained our staff with that plan. Uh, I said that's my last one, but I actually, to add one more, um, when you do your plan, and I'm not sure this is part of the template or not, uh, but be thinking about how you're going to take care of your staff during a disaster, um, because they're going to work incredibly hard long hours, do things that aren't fun, do things that aren't their normal job. Um, secondary trauma is real. You may have staff members dealing with primary trauma. Um, so just be prepared uh, to take care of your staff because they're going to be the ones that see you through. Thanks. Wow. Hearing <laughs> from someone who's in the middle of it is um, pretty... Um just inspiring and motivating to um, work on plans and follow all your advice. Our next speaker is Teresa, um, and her disaster happened a little further ago, but is nonetheless still very impactful. Um, and here she is. And yeah, and um, Dan mentioned in the chat, I'll just repeat it again verbally. Um, you can put questions in at any time and we'll answer them all at the end. Go ahead, Teresa. Um, let's see, I'm trying to, how do I get control of the PowerPoint? You should have a take control somewhere at the top. I'm going to go it? ahead and share it okay. first. I have to bring it up. Thank you. You should be able to control it with the arrows at the bottom of the screen. And once you do that, your arrow keys on your keyboard should work. But yeah, either okay. way, either of those options works. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. My name is Teresa Nantor. I'm the Director of Rental Housing Development at Community Housing Improvement Program. Um, and our acronym is CHIP. We um, were established in 1973. Um, we're, we'll be celebrating our 50 year anniversary next year. Um, we're a nonprofit organization of 501c3. Uh, we operate in the Northern California region. Uh, we cover seven counties. Um, we cover a seven county region. We have um, our, there are several departments within our organization. We've got our self-help program, our multifamily development program, and property management as well. Uh, we assist low-income rural disadvantaged residents, seniors, and others who lack resources um, with providing adequate and safe affordable housing. CHIP owns and operates 18 properties with over 750 units, and we're still growing. Um, today, I'm here to talk about um, the lessons learned from um, responding to a disaster, um, but I just want to give you um, a, some context on how we got here and, and what prompted us to be prepared. Um, there were um, 
um, multiple disasters that happened prior to the largest uh, fire that we had, which was the campfire. The first one was the Orville Dam spill that collapsed, and that prompted our staff to begin thinking along the lines of how do we prepare to respond to a disaster, not just on an organization level, but also for our properties as well. And as you can see from 17, 18, 2022, and 2021, there have been a series of disasters in Northern California um, that has tested the strength of our organization and um, our staff and, and our residents as well. Um, and that prompted us to start beginning to think along the lines of how do we prepare um, prepare for a disaster. And some of the steps that we've taken uh, to do that is to know what our risks are and start preparing for that. So it's thinking along the lines of insurance, um, you know, evaluating our insurance on our properties, on our building for our office, um, and determining is it sufficient enough to rebuild? Um, what are the exemptions to coverage? Um, and if we do rebuild, um, how would we afford to rebuild um, in, in is that you know if the property burns down um, is that somewhere we want to rebuild e evaluate in the geographic area as well we talked about understanding insurance coverage um, and we also encourage our um, our staff as well uh, to evaluate their insurance coverage on their properties um, as well as our residents as well um, encouraging them to get uh, apartment insurance as well you want to build your team, you know, assemble your team um, and assign roles and tasks for individuals to respond to the disaster. Um, what one thing we did do and the, the previous speakers talked about was um, establish a text now system. I see he talked about texting was the most valuable way um, that he had to respond. So we have a, a agency wide text now system. We also have a text now system for our residents as well. Um, so we can notify our residents as things um, change in the environment. Um, because, you know, every year fire season comes around and it, there's risk of fire. And now also we recently had some rain. So now we have fl flood as well, unfortunately. Um, so just staying in communication, having that basic line of communication, um, you know, just realizing that everyone won't have access to Internet service. But text now is a reliable service. Um, again, we talked about assigning roles on our team. Um, so, you know, our HR department played a critical role, also our property management staff as well. Um, but as the gentleman spoke before, no one person can be the, the sole center of, um, you know, uh, headquarters. You've got to have multiple people on your team who are able to carry out tasks in a disaster. Uh, when we talk along the lines about our properties, we also looked at, uh, spoke with our lenders on what some of their requirements were if a disaster happened um, as far as rebuilding and safety measures. And now even as we look at new properties, we um, have Im implemented some measures um, in our building standards as well to prevent uh, fire and uh, disasters. Um, one of the measures that we've done is clear the brush around our um, buildings because the thing, it's not just the risk of the, the fire approaching, it's the embers that spark off of the um, brush around your buildings. Um, so that's something that we've done. Uh, some making critical information quickly and easily accessible. Again, that goes back to that text now system. Also building um, networks with your local government agencies and social service agencies as well, um, being in connection with those folks. Let's see. The other one is to keep your records um, updated and list of emergency contacts. So on a regular basis, our human resource department sends out uh, contact information for our staff. They, we're regularly asking for updated inf contact information, not just for staff, but also residents as well. So we can uh, uh, stay informed about who is on site available uh, to respond and if we need to um, advise folks to move to other areas. Um, again, everyone has a role. Um, emergency protocols in place are important. You want to have that evacuation plan. You want to have um, emergency supplies on site, not just at your headquarters, but you want to have them at your properties as well. Um, another uh, thing that we've done, uh, we secured a grant to uh, provide emergency preparedness kits for our residents um, so they can have them in their homes. Um, and then we advise them to have them located near the door or in their vehicles in a time of need if they need to leave. 
Um, so it's not again, it's a it's a multi-layer approach. You've got to be, you know, involved actively with your community. Sense. You've got to have your residents um, informed that, you know, things can happen and they need to be ready to respond. The other thing is you want to test your plan as well. Um, you know, it's not en just enough to have a plan in place, but you want to test it to make sure it actually works. Um, you know, because disaster can happen at any time. Um, so our tech, our text now system is regularly tested on a monthly basis to make sure that works. Um, and when our um, executive director also meets with the local government officials, we have a um, a working group that um, you know stays abreast on emergency um, response. So we talked about the, the biggest fire in California history, um, and I think it's now been surpassed with the last fire, but the car, uh, the campfire is the one we're talking about um, that destroyed one of our properties. And um, there were more than 19,000 um, structures that were destroyed, unfortunately, and 14,000 homes. Um, and so that was about 14% of the housing stock. 85 um, people perished in that fire, um, and the fire covered 153 acres. So you can imagine the size of the disaster. Um, we have Paradise Community Village. It was a 33 unit building. Um, it took us 10 years to build this structure and it burned down all in one day, unfortunately. Um, and so this is the remnants of um, what was left after the fire. We've got a picture here. We have since rebuilt it. Um, we have 11 families that were um, living at the property were able to move back in. We used the same plans um, to re um, to to rebuild the structure. Um, but some of those things that you can see here, as I talked about clearing the brush, you can see it around the out, outer perimeter of the building. So all of that was cleared. Um, some of the design standards, we improved the ventilation, the windows, things like that um, to reduce the risk of fire. One important thing to talk about as we talk about residents who um, were displaced is that you need to be aware that um, not just your residents, but also staff as well. Um, after a disaster happens, um, there's that PTSD. You know, you may be in recovery mode and responding, but then, you know, people can be traumatized by disaster. You lose everything in one night. And so it does take time to recover, not just physical possessions, but also mentally as well. Uh, so you need to be aware of that, partner with your local uh, social service and mental health organizations to provide referrals and resources for your staff and residents. So the resilience of the community. So some of the things that CHIP did do um, before the fire and preparing for it again, as I spoke about, was um, have an effective emergency operation system. And that was all of our county social service partners um, regularly meet to talk about disaster preparedness um, and how to respond and then also identify points of contact. Um, the interjurisdictional support and regional collaboration uh, was very critical during that time. Um, they assisted us. Uh, FEMA came to the table as well um, when we when we uh, began to talk about rebuilding, um, bringing folks back home, and they were at the table, some of the government agencies. Um, the extreme effects of long-term recovery groups, um, you know, you want to stay involved in the long-term recovery. It's easy to be on that front end when a disaster happens, but really um, what takes a lot of patience and determination is that long-term recovery and rebuilding, because as we know, it we, you can't rebuild overnight. Um, it takes several years. Um, that fire happened in 2018. Folks were just moving in last year at the end of 2021. So you're looking at at least three years, um, and that was three years with a lot of um, uh, partnership and work from the local foundations, government officials, uh, FEMA as well. Um, you want to have a strong community response. Uh, let let your partners know, um, your residents as well. Um, be aware, you know, that we need their their support and, and involvement as well in the in the effort to rebuild and respond. Um, so we were able to partner with some social service agencies that came in, like I said, provided emergency preparedness kits. Um, our local fire department um, comes in and talks about fire prevention and things like that. Um, so we continue to evolve our model um, and adapt and provide um, uh, resources for our residents and staff to prepare them for um, 
a natural disaster. Uh, you want to talk have accessibility to your local government officials because they're critical when we talk about responding and rebuilding. Um, you know, to have that line of communication, whether it's your executive director or directors on your staff, to have a point in contact, particularly when you're talking about small rural areas, having those partnerships and accessibility um, to your local government officials because they'll be able to tap into resources very quickly. Um, your state and federal resources will uh, come to the table, but they're usually not, uh, you know, readily available at the dime. It takes time to get them to the table um, to start talking about funding and capacity to rebuild. So just be aware that nothing happens overnight. It takes time for folks to respond and get there. Um, but if you have those strong networks in place from the beginning, then you're in line as resources come available. You want to focus on preparedness also, uh, creating a defensible space as we talked about, resilience and building materials um, as we looked at the Dixie fire and the campfire um, and as fires continue, uh, uh, you know, here in California and across the nation. So again, it's it's that prepare, um, I'm sorry, prevention, prepare, and you want to respond adequately. Um, that's all for my PowerPoint presentation. And uh, Daniel will take down the slides. It'll take a few seconds for it to load. Thank you so much, Teresa, for sharing. Um, it's so wonderful to get a perspective, um, someone a little further along down the road, um, have having experienced this. And you know, just different disasters happen in different parts of the country, from flooding to to fires. I'm going to take a moment to um, share the um, hacks new part of their webs of our website. It's called the R Rural Resilience, and it's under the Our Work tab, Rural Resilience in the Face of Disaster. Um, some of your questions that I've already seen come through in the chat um, may be answered here. Um, disasters in general, which um, the presenters have referred to there being three phases. First, readiness, which um, I think attendees are mostly in the preparation phase. The immediate response, um, Scott talked about, you know, bringing water to people and things like that, and then recovery long-term years of um, rebuilding. Um, so with those three phases, there's um, there's three pages additionally that we'll go further into that in a moment. Just wanted to keep showing the homepage. There's some news and updates um, just as different um, policies come through or disasters. Um, you'll be able to see them here. This is a really neat um, tool. Uh, every county in the U.S. and um, what is the uh, risk of disaster rating. So you can hover over any given county. Here we are, Ocean County, New Jersey, 45.5 risk index, um, which anything to 30 is high. So you'll see the coastal areas are darker um, with, you know, flood chances and, and fire um, opportunities, but some um, sprinkled in as well. Um, go ahead and look at the readiness um, portion. Within readiness, um, there's four subcategories. Plan readiness as a definition, planning resources, strategies, and information building your network. I'm also going to take just this moment to show that there's a new um, accessibility feature on HACS website in general. I had the seizure safe mode on um, because there was some a video on the first page that doesn't share well. Um, but now that that's off, I can put on, there's a reading bar um, that might be, is it, um, let's see, well, oh, went too far. Um, it's here, there we go, that can help with reading large blocks of text. So if you were um, reading this readiness section, you could just highlight over what you were reading and be able to see it better. So lots of options in the accessibility um, toolbar. So after the definition of readiness, there are planning resources. HACC has um, collated planning resources from a number of different um, partners, enterprise, community um, partners, um, Disaster Justice Network, um, a, a long list you'll see here. Um, that's one part of preparation. Here's the strategies. Um, you can, another resource from Rural Lisk, you can assess your organization to determine um, where you would uh, 
how you could respond to a disaster, um, other um, financial preparation from the small, small business um, association and protecting your data and then building your network. We heard um, Scott mention VOAD. There are voluntary organizations active in disaster. There any um, nonprofit organization that, you know, like the Red Cross or another group would be distributing water and doing the other like actual um, reaction um, to the to the disaster um, assistance and help you team up with any other groups that might be doing that or be prepared to contact them for support as you need it. Um, that is the readiness section and the four um, categories within that. Within the response section, we'll load that. There's three response, emergency release, re relief resources, and disaster updates. So the response, again, there's a discussion and definition of what response is. And then um, again, HACC has compiled a number of emergency relief resources. So the Red Cross would be um, a relief organization. You could contact FEMA um, if you are in the um, high, high, mo you know, high impact moments initially after a disaster. The um, and this and again, disaster updates um, as news comes out. Um, there are sort of um, the sections are split up by by little interest um, articles, and this carrot at the side will bring you all the way back to the top. Some web management things here, and the third phase after readiness and response is recovery. And within the recovery section, there's um, discussion and definition of recovery, recovery resources, success stories of rural resilience, and an opportunity for you to submit your own story. So here's the um, the recovery definition and discussion. Again, recovery res recovery resources um, collated by hack from um, primarily third party groups. USDA, um, NeighborWorks, FDIC, there's um, a number of resources here, VA Disaster Res Assistance to Veterans, HUD. Um, so resources on each phase. Um, a few success stories, um, one in California, another in Texas, how organizations were able to respond to disasters and um, there's an opportunity here. You can click the link and you can submit, um, you know, your your story or at least the beginning of it so that um, Hack can contact you and find out more details. The very last thing um, I think Scott mentioned that we do have a. Um, a toolkit for. Um, building your business continuity and disaster recovery plan. If you go to download it, um, there's some additional information here, and you have to click download template. Be forwarded to another um, a place to fill in information, and it, as soon as you click submit, it will automatically um, download the business continuity um, and disaster recovery um, template which the first page looks like this. Um, it's 118 pages of a well thought out um, plan. You can have the opportunity to put in your organization specific inf information throughout, but um, a long list of things um, that you would think about in preparing for disaster. You know, what um, what risks do you have, what strengths do you have, what weaknesses, and, um, you know, developing the list of your your employees contact information um a oh, wide here you go all these yellow um things are for for your organization to fill in um and i think that is the most of what i planned to say and um with that we're going to start going to um field any questions the i saw a number come in um, in the beginning, one about storage. Um, it's uh, the so Michael Howard said that they have um, some experience and expertise that they can um, provide perspective as well. And um, 
and that storage was a, a huge issue to to house all the donations. Let's see. Um, oh, and Christina shared the toolkit um, with you in the chat. So I guess just a, a first question for both Scott and Teresa. Um, uh, who were the most valuable partners that you worked with um, in your your disaster response? And that you're both muted. Yeah, we're both waiting for the other one to go first. Uh, <laughs> so, wow, that's a great question. Um, uh, Teresa mentioned local governments, and I think that's huge. Um, we served three counties and, and we had probably uh, uh, great relationships with local governments in one and, and pretty good in another and just don't know the third as well. And um, it's been harder for us to get traction, obviously, in the county we don't know. Um, I think your other groups that are going to be responding, your, your, your peers, your, uh, the other nonprofits that are going to be there, um, have been in critical. Um, I think those are probably for us have been the most important, those two, two, two groups. Yeah, I'll say our local government for sure um, was the most helpful, but also um, we have a local foundation as well um, who stepped in, provided resources um, for the disaster preparedness kit, also to respond on, um, you know, for folks who lost their housing. Um, they have additionally been assisting us in rebuilding as well and hiring staff uh, to rebuild in the area. Uh, so our local foundation, again, was uh, critical um, in this in this process. How familiar were you with the disaster recovery infrastructure prior to this work and how and how did you become familiar with it? You want to go ahead, Scott, since you're in the midst of it. Yeah, so like I said, for us, having been through some minor ones previously, um, we were pretty familiar. Um, and so that helped um, a lot. Um, and, and so I do think as you prepare for how you might respond to disaster to, to get that familiarity, um, uh, it, you know, to know your state Kentucky or your state emergency management folks a little bit to have talked to them uh, is, is probably a pretty good idea. Um, you don't want to know them as well as we know them today, but to know a little bit about them um, beforehand is, is, is real useful and the process and just, you know, the flow, the, the, the sorts of resources that are going to be available. Uh, you know, Michael men mentioned storage. If you have a major disaster, it's unbelievable the um, the response that the VOAD groups, the volunteer organizations, can connect you with, and the amount of materials and supplies and all that you can get donated. Um, and and so, yeah, to be be prepared for that, I think is important. And for for our agency, um, we um, we were novices. Obviously, we had a plan in place, but you never know how your plan's going to roll out until you actually have when you're in a crisis. Um, so we were novice, um, but we did have a strong communication system in place, and we felt like you know the lines of communication did remain open with folks on the ground, our staff, um, property management staff, um, and our local government. Um, we had a direct line to them as well. Um, in the rebuilding efforts, FEMA stepped in, was very helpful um, through that process. Um, the state as well with the tax credits, because our property was the first tax credit property that burned down. Um, and so they were very helpful in, in um, providing resources um, to get our project up and going very quickly um, and get it through the process. Lance typed a question in the chat. Did you take any risks and spend money when you were not sure if you would be reimbursed by FEMA or other entities? Well, there's always risk up front and you have to spend money. You know, you've got to clear that once it burns down, people forget about you've got to spend money to clear, <laughs> clear to burn trees and the buildings. Um, so you'll spend money up front, you know, to get things cleared up. And, and when you start that process, you think, OK, this is step one, but that's one of many that will come along the lines and you've got to have a lot of patience through that. 
Um, so you're always spending money, you know, you've got that pre-development, even if there wasn't a disaster, but with a disaster, you know, they, they want the, the site to be cleaned up very quickly and, and to start moving to the recovery phase. So, of course, you're, you know, obviously you're spending money. Um, and you also have to spend money to invest in your infrastructure to be prepared to respond to a disaster, um, to develop those systems and plans. Um, and we did receive a grant to um, develop that emergency response system, um, and we, we continue to build upon that. And it's always, you know, you always have to go back to that and evaluate it. You know, it's not something that you, you develop one time and you, you put it on the shelf and collect dust until disaster happens. It needs to be in your regular rotation, uh, whether it be quarterly, uh, you know, twice a year or something that you're constantly evaluating as things change. Yeah, we absolutely did. Um, we we knew uh, we were really fortunate that we did get that, you know, we kind of jumped in and trusted that some money was going to come and, and we got that initial grant uh, or donation. And then we just kind of assumed more money would come and it did. Um, I mean, you have to be realistic. I mean, we had we have uh, some resources um, that we knew we could spend and we were hoping we would get them covered and wouldn't have to spend them on that. But you do what you have to do and hope. But at the same time, I mean, it, um, you can't. If you don't have cash, um, you're going to, even if the money's coming, if you don't have the cash to pay your staff um, or to, you know, whatever the expense is, then, then that's bad. Um, so you do have to be realistic. We got another question here from Michael Howard. Did you have long-term recovery groups already set up or did you have to start one? And if you had one, was it dormant or was it something that was well known and ready to go when needed? So our situation, it varied. Um, we actually had a flood in 2021 in one county, and that committee had just about wrapped up their work. Um, and so they had largely, um, there were a few open projects they were still working on, but it was, we were just about done with that flood. Um, and so that committee really reorganized almost immediately, or not, not even really had to reorganize, just kind of reactivated. Um, the other two counties, we had to start from scratch, um, and they are both still um, in the process of getting those stood up. We did have some systems in place, um, but it wasn't necessarily developed. Um, dedicated to the long-term recovery. It was more of a just an initial response um, working group. Um, and so as you move into long-term recovery, then you have to identify additional partners at your state and uh, federal level. And you both mentioned um, mental health or, you know, primary and secondary trauma as um, key pieces to think about. And I don't think that's yet included in any of our resources. So would you, um, share a little more expand on that or mention if there's any places people could um go to have have those things set up in advance but yeah what were good resources you you connected with so some of the resources that we connected with was our local county behavioral health um organization um and um our local um um uh, university extension program they provide resources um and um you know like uh, uh groups for um for ptsd to talk about trauma and disaster and um, you know because sometimes it's that shared experience that bonds people um when you feel like you're not on that island by yourself um so part of our the building that we rebuilt um we have a group where we started providing dinners uh so folks could come and talk about you know being back in that same space because you can imagine if your home was destroyed there and now you're living there again i'm sure there's a certain amount of trauma uh, that's associated with that. And so our local um, um, university extension program provides a, um, a dinner and they, you know, have a, a, it's more like a conversational group, but it's also, it's therapy and sharing your, your lived experience. Um, we partner with the Red Cross, obviously, um, some local churches as well, who've been able to support us in our efforts. I think it, it may be a VOAD group, but I know we, um had an offer for um, support services that that first that 
not first responders, but uh, people who are um, helping people in in, a, in the disaster could actually reach out for support uh, for themselves that you know, we shared, of course, with our staff. I'll try to get that, find out who that was. It, they may be, I don't know if they were a local organization or national, um, but if it's anything that might help other folks, we'll share that. Um, and then a lot of it is just, you know, acknowledging and taking care of your staff like you would during any sort of difficult time. I mean, everything from, um, you know, we we would do go and pick up coffee for everybody just, you know, just to, as a way of saying thank you. Um, probably the most, health, you know, kind of mental health related thing we did is we sh we made the decision not to uh, participate over, over Labor Day weekend and what we was an influx of volunteers um, because our staff needed to have a three-day weekend. We actually gave everybody an extra day and split up. Um, half the staff worked Friday and half the staff worked Tuesday. So everybody could actually get a four-day weekend um, just to, to decompress a little bit. That's great. So we have just a couple of minutes left. If there's anyone else who wants to um, ask a question or make a comment, you can unmute yourself and, um, and say it verbally. Um, or if, um, you know, I can read out another question from the chat if you prefer that um, mechanism. Allison, I had one thing I just throw out real quick. Um, I, we, by dumb luck, happened to have a shower um, in one of our buildings. It's, we didn't plan it. It just was there when we got it. And it was amazing. Uh, you know, our particular disaster uh, impacted water. Um, and, and a lot of the county. And so just to have that available for your staff, um, hmm. I wish uh, we we're going to add a washer dryer hookup to that facility. So next time we have one. Um, so those are sorts of things that I wouldn't have thought about, but uh, some of those just simple, um, you know, we had guys, we had folks mucking out houses and just to let them have going home to no water, to let them have a shower was, was a big thing. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't have thought of that. And any other pro tips? That's great. Um, and we're getting some um, gratitude here. Um, I'll share in that this has been extensively useful. A lot of great information, a lot of motivation to prepare, and some real um, concrete, actionable advice um, from both of you that, um, you know, incredibly valuable. Thank you for sharing your time. And I, I don't know how many organizations we have um, represented here, but definitely expanded their capacity um, of, of all those represented organizations here in just an hour. Um, and that's, of course, HACS mission, rural capacity building. Any, um, let's see, I don't, yeah. We're just getting some more gratitude. Please um, share as you um, are willing. Um, and we are at time. I don't know if this will um, close us out um, automatically or um, or I think we will be able to stay as long if as it, people want just a few extra moments. And maybe Dan will announce, tell us what's going on next. So, yeah, so check out the relatively website. Relatively shortly, we will close out the webinar. If someone has a final question or wants to say anything, please jump in. But otherwise, we'll end it for everyone and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, and consult the website and the um, Thank you business so much. continuity plan um, for for res all the resources that you can find. I'll leave with this one last note is as we live through natural disasters and climate change is to give yourself grace uh, to make mistakes um, and also your staff as well, because we're all learning through the process um, and to be patient, um, you know, as you continue to learn and build your, your network and resources. Well, thanks for everyone for taking an hour out of your day and joining us. For this, we hope you got something out of it. Um, and we'll see you next time. All right. Take care till then. Get some rest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> rest.